All right, we are recording. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the White Collar Week Tuesday speaker series. Our special guest speaker tonight is Glenn Martin. Glenn's been a friend of mine for quite a while now, um, since uh, before he started Just Leadership USA, when that was in the planning stages. And um, Glenn's a uh, been ultra successful at everything he does, and he's going to share uh, his story with us tonight and his wisdom some of his um, successes, his failures, uh, kind of clue us in on um, how we can make the most of our common experience and um, succeed despite, despite uh, a lot of the obstacles that are thrown at us. Um, I'm just gonna read this bio real fast. For over de two decades, Glenn Martin successfully founded and directed a handful of national organizations in the nonprofit sector. Glenn has occupied the role of visionary while developing a strong track record in the more pragmatic aspects of building and running successful organizations, including fundraising, operations, administration, and communications. Before launching both Gem Real Estate and Gem Trainers, a multi-state real estate investment company and successful nonprofit consultancy, Glenn founded and served as president of Just Leadership USA, where we... Um, where um, an organization he built as a tribute to his son, Joshua, dedicated to cutting the U.S. correctional population in half by 2030. For over 20 years since leaving prison, he's been a part of the vanguard of successful reform advocates in America. Glenn has a quote that he coined in prison in 2000 that guides the work of gem trainers, people closest to the problem or closest to the solution but furthest from power and resources. So folks, anytime you see that stolen by other people, know that it was Glenn's, Glenn coined that phrase. And you know who you are, Ford Foundation people. Do not be using Glenn Martin's quote without permission. Uh, I'm not gonna read the rest of this right now, but Glenn has an incredible background, including uh, a stint at the Legal Action Center where I am uh, proud to be a board member and at the Fortune Society, and then of course, Just Leadership USA. Um, he's gone on from there, and now, now I'm winging it. He's gone on from there to found GEM Trainers, which trains people in um, funding their nonprofits and a whole other, a uh, bunch of other things that, uh, that Glenn brings to the table. And he's also um, now a social entrepreneur buying up real estate in depressed areas around the country. Uh, um, rehabbing them and then renting them out to people with criminal justice and other related issues. So it's a tremendous social project. Glenn is also uh, lecturing on that, trying to bring other entrepreneurs into the fold so that he's not alone and we can uh, we can solve a huge social problem while doing well by doing good. How's that, Glenn? Not too bad, huh? That was almost perfect. The not part where you the part where you said Glenn is successful at everything he does, you should have said Glenn is successful at <laughs> in his bio. I don't successful at everything I do. Anyway, Jeff, thank thanks for inviting me. It's good to be back. Yeah. So um, just just let me uh, do a little housekeeping here. Um, <clears throat> this is sponsored by our White Collar Support Group and Pro Progressive, Progressive Prison Ministries. We have a support group that meets every Monday night for people who are justice impacted and especially, but not exclusively, white collar. You can find us um, online at uh, uh, 7 a.m. Eastern on Mondays. If you'd like an invitation, um, you can send it to us at info at prisonist.org and we'll get you on the list. Um, this coming Monday is our 378th meeting. So we've been doing it for seven and a half years and a bunch of our members are on tonight. So welcome everybody. Um, let's see, there's a few things coming up. Um, in the next month, I just want to let you all know about on uh, our friend Chris Poulos is um, the executive director of the Center for Justice and Human Dignity, and he has a, a sentencing conference that's coming up on October 16th and 17th. Uh, you can find out about it online, or if not, you can hit us up on our website at prisoners.org, and the link is there. Um, very reasonable for people from coming from nonprofits. On uh, November 3rd, uh, the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section is having its Fall Institute. It's free for anyone who wants to attend in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, 15 of us met there last year because we ran a panel and then we all went out to dinner. So if anybody wants to meet me in Washington on uh, on <clears throat> on those days on uh, November November third, um, I'd be happy to buy dinner for everyone again this year. That was the that was a blast last year. And um, the Legal Action Center um, is having its benefit uh, in New York City on uh, November seventh, um, which I will be at. So since I'll be in D.C. and uh, New York for that week. Anyone who wants to get together for lunch or dinner, uh, let me know and uh, we can definitely plan a get together. So uh, that's it for housekeeping. Without further, um, Glenn, you have uh, 30, 40 minutes to, uh, to uh, um, impart your wisdom and then with your permission, we'll go to uh, Q&A or sharing. Um, and uh, we have a hard stop tonight at 8.30. So uh, Glenn, take it away. Oh, cool. Where should I start? You don't have any questions for me? Should I just jump? <laughs> no, jump right, jump right in, man. Tell, tell your story and then and then tell us your, your kind of nonprofit and then into social enterprise story. Sure. Thanks for that. I see a lot of familiar faces. So hopefully folks who already know me will learn a thing or two new that they didn't know before. Um, I served six years in prison in New York State, uh, came out in the year 2000. And like most uh, formerly incarcerated folks, uh, really struggled looking for employment, spent about 30 days visiting about 50 different employers only to get turned down over and over and over again, based solely uh, or at least primarily on the criminal record. Quickly realized that the stigma of the criminal conviction is something that was just going to get in the way no matter how much uh, I did while I was in prison to try to turn things around, including earning a quality liberal arts two-year degree. Um, met a guy named George Lino. Uh, I'm not sure why I'll just never forget this guy's name. I haven't seen him in 20 something years, but a formerly incarcerated guy who was running a reentry program at the time. And he just really took me under his wings and said, look, you know, you're me five years ago and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you land safely. And he meant that. Uh, he showed up at my house almost every day to get me out of bed and get me out there looking for a job and would not give up. And one day he finally said, uh, I have a job opening that I think is a good fit for you. And it was the front desk clerk at the Legal Action Center. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a nonprofit public interest law firm in New York City. Uh, I took the job. The job didn't pay too much. Uh, I owed $83,000 in fine fees, restitution and child support. Um, but I knew I was working around some really smart public interest attorneys that I could learn a lot from. Stayed there for about six years, moved on to be the senior, uh, the associate vice president at the Fortune Society in New York. Um, that was an interesting experience. Stayed there for about six and a half years, launched the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy. So really went there to do advocacy, uh, then took over marketing and communications, then took over development, helped grow the organization from about 10 million to about 20 million uh, took over workforce development for a short while, so running a huge portion of the agency. And then one day I realized that the more I emerged as the exception to the rule, the more I'd enforce the rule about formerly incarcerated people and what their capacities are and so on. And I didn't want to be a person who uh, was emerging as like a poster child that, uh, again, reinforced the narrative about the majority of other people. So what I noticed was that there was a huge investment made in me along the way. Not that I was exceptional, but that I was exposed to exceptional opportunities. And how could I package that and share it with other formerly incarcerated people? And that was around the time that Jeff came on my radar. And Jeff, you know, I haven't said this uh, yet. I should have said it as soon as I opened up. But it's been amazing to watch your personal and professional trajectory over the last few years. It is. Uh, I just listened to a podcast with you the other day talking about the EIDL loans and people getting themselves in trouble. And it was so informative, so clear, so succinct. And I was just so proud of you um, because you were really standing in your truth and your power. And it's good to see you standing so tall these days. So it's been fascinating to watch your journey. Um, and then went on to uh, launch Just Leadership USA, uh, raised a bunch of money, opened a bunch of offices, hired a bunch of people, trained a bunch of formerly incarcerated folks, launched a campaign to close Rikers, launched other campaigns around the country, built a membership of people in all 50 states around the country. 
And after moving on from there, moving on is a euphemism for getting kicked out. Um, I uh, took a year and really did some self-assessment, uh, thought to myself, you know, where could I grow? Where could I invest in myself? And then moved into the private sector. I've always been someone that's been intrigued in how we can leverage the private sector to do good. And how can you do good and do well? I come from extreme poverty. I come from being on Section 8. I come from public assistance, single parent household. Um, and even though I ended up in the nonprofit space for over 17 years, always been intrigued by the idea of building wealth so that my children and my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, uh, hopefully will not have to take the path I took uh, and will have a different, less painful trajectory. Um, and started out with gem trainers, which was easy for me. I mean, I can help people build a nonprofit in my sleep uh, after you sort of do it once, especially if you do it big time. You sort of uh, know uh, the, where the pitfalls are and where the opportunities are. And then about a year later, um, decided to start investing in real estate. And there's a deeper story there. Maybe we'll get into it. But started in Savannah, did really well in that market, moved over into uh, Birmingham and Montgomery and started investing in low-income houses using the Burr method to identify houses that had deferred maintenance and taking advantage of the equity that sort of uh, in, inside of those properties and leveraging that equity to continue to buy, buy, buy. And in four years, essentially purchased about 90 different properties. Uh, last year alone, purchased 39 in one day and ran through the rehab of those to get them stabilized. And, you know, it's been interesting to get management companies on board and have them tell me like, oh, don't worry, we're going to screen out people with criminal records. And I'm like, uh, oh, you got the wrong owner and help to educate them on the importance of allowing applications from formerly incarcerated folks. Anyway, I'm tired of listening to myself. So why don't you ask some questions, Jeff? Um. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I, I, I feel like I know your story so well that if I actually know the answers to some of these questions, just know this is kind of talk show host stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I want to I go back first to when you were planning just leadership. You, you, you had um, exited the Fortune Society and then you had this big idea. And I know that it was a tough sell. You had to fund it up in advance. And the reason I'm, I'm and all these questions, by the way, I'm going to ask you uh, over, over the next few minutes are really based of, um, so that people who are coming out and now are trying to get their, um, trying to get hard ground under their feet, they understand that it's possible, but you got to work through problems and you got to be a problem solver and you got to put together a, uh, a team of people who support you. And also there's people who are gonna try to bring you down. So at, and, um, at, the mo at that particular moment, you had this big idea, but I don't think that it was fully formed. And you were trying to figure out not only what was gonna work, but also what could be funded. So okay. like, where were you in that head at that, at that point? Yep. I'm going to answer your question, but first I'm going to go back to another important moment about six years earlier. When I left Legal Action Center, I thought I was going to launch something in that moment. And one of the key funders in the space, I remember where we were standing. I remember the time of the day, the day of the week, the month of the year. And she looked me in the face and said, you're not ready to build your own nonprofit. And I felt insulted and I felt uh, beat up and I felt I was just angry, upset, everything else. And she was so 110% right. Um, the six years plus that I did at the Fortune Society really did prepare me to go on and launch Just Leadership USA. But you're right. I left a job making 175 grand a year or so into nothingness with a concept paper for a vision of something that was way larger than anyone in the space could have imagined and probably way larger uh, than anything I could have actually brought into the universe. And so uh, as I sort of went out, ventured out, started talking to key stakeholders, started talking to people I trust, getting feedback from people about what's feasible, what's not feasible, pushing the envelope where I thought that people weren't being visionary uh, enough. Um, I really took the model, which is like this 13 page concept paper that I still hold on to actually it started on a napkin. I actually have a picture of just leadership drawn on a napkin years ago, and then it led into this 13 page concept paper. 
And if you read the concept paper now, it is pretty consistent with what I was able to build. Um, but uh, the implementation looks a bit different than the original vision. And you're right. Part of it was based on what was fundable at the time. Anytime you do something that is ahead of the idea curve, you're probably ahead of the funding curve. Like if philanthropy had already caught up, if philanthropy was already doing it, then one, it probably would not be novel. It probably would not be unique. It probably would not be groundbreaking. Um, but also everyone else would be doing it because the resources are there to be able to do so. So part of it is getting enough resources to launch into a vision of something that feels new and different and challenges the status quo. Um, and then the other part of it is sort of bringing everyone along and figuring out how to do that in a way that doesn't alienate people and push them so hard that they're not willing to lean in, um, but allows you to get enough resources through the door to start chipping away at the vision and just getting people to the point of asking, what if? I think if you can get people to what if, like what if he's right? What if we could do that? What if you can train formerly incarcerated leaders around the country to run their own organizations, to work in philanthropy, to build their own campaigns? Um, and that's where I wanted to get people and slowly but surely with people like you, Jeff, and others, um, I think I was able to make that make the case and then also bring philanthropy along. And I think that's the part most people couldn't see. And that's where people who try to do bold things, I think, don't get credit from far away. It looks like they're doing one thing when the truth is they're actually doing something else. And here's where the judgment lies and what people think you're doing. People see me on stage with, say, John Legend at the time, and they'd say, like, oh, look at him on stage with a celebrity. He just wants to hang out with celebrities. No. There was a key moment in the Rikers campaign where I felt like we had lost the messaging to the New York City mayor, and we needed someone who was influential, whose voice went a lot further than everyone else's, to essentially educate people on what the next step of the campaign was. But most people don't see that. They just see me sitting on stage with John Legend and there's some assumption about what's happening when it's not really what's happening. I hope that responds to your question. Yeah. So um, wh wh why don't we talk about close Rikers for a second? Because th that was probably the campaign that you were most known for. But in some ways, that's a bigger undertaking than Just Leadership was because Just Leadership was all about positive things going forward. And here you're taking on layers of not just bureaucracy, but people who had a lot of money invested in keeping the status quo. And now you got this crazy idea. And how realistic in your mind was it that you could actually get it done? Or was it kind of a... Um, a uh, a, a leader that if, if if that you'd be able to put together a hundred different organizations and you'd be able to start taking out all kinds of other cool ideas that would kind of come under the banner of that success. I mean, did you really think that you could close Rikers or not? Yeah, that's a really good question. A couple of things. Um, one, I think if uh, my sort of tenure at Just Leadership didn't end the way it did, Rikers would be closed now because I was surrounded by a real kick-ass team of hardworking people who would have gotten it to the finish line. They were very strategic. We had a plan that was a multi-year plan. We would have kept our foot on the gas and kept our foot on the necks of the mayor to get it done. So I do regret uh, the loss of that opportunity. The second thing I would say is um, you conjure up a, a vision of an anaconda swallowing a, a deer. Like you might get it down, but it might still kill you. And that's what it felt like running the Close Rikers campaign while I was also building an organization, particularly because it was the first time we were showing up as agitators. You know, before that, it was like, oh, yeah, invest in formerly incarcerated people. Like most people didn't even know what that meant. They it sort of sounded good. Are you giving awards? Are you doing graduations? Are you doing trainings? What does that look like? Is there coaching? People can sort of get behind that. And I can't tell you how many funders ask me, why don't you just do that? And so literally launching into the Close Rikers campaign, um, you know, there's an old saying that says power concedes nothing without a demand. And so by definition, the campaign was a demand. And what most people couldn't see from far away is that while the mayor was the decision maker about whether we would close Rikers, like the target was really clear. It wasn't the city of New York. It was the mayor of New York. He had the chance to make that decision. Um, but the mayor by far was not my uh, biggest or most shrewd opposition. 
my most shrewd opposition was two groups of folks. One was the abolitionists, the staunch purist abolitionists, who said that if we didn't close down every single jail bed in New York City, that we would become the vitriol of their efforts. And they were not lying. Um, they were telling the truth. Um, and then number two, many of the reentry nonprofits in New York City that benefit from providing services on Rikers uh, by having grants from New York City. Um, those organizations were not as blunt as the abolitionists. I wish they were. Um, but they made it clear to me that I was a problem to them. And part of it was that they just couldn't see the vision of the work they could be doing if Rikers were closed. And strangely enough, one of the first wins that we got, the first win we got was getting young people off Rikers. That happened almost immediately once the mayor realized that we were serious. But the second win was $30 million by the mayor in an RFP to fund employment services for people who were on Rikers. He was doing anything he could short of closing Rikers to try to blunt the kind of um, momentum we were building with the campaign. So I say all that to say the very reentry organizations that pulled me aside and told me I should stop saying close Rikers, I should abandon the effort, it'll never happen, too much money and resources, et cetera, et cetera. I can't tell you some of the things people have said in my ear, people who you all probably know and like. Um, but in the end, what I found was that uh, they were the ones who ultimately benefited the most from the campaign, arguably. Um, and to answer the other part of your question about did I think it would close, what would often happen is I would say close Rikers and people would say, how and then what happens? And what I would realize is that if you can hold an idea long enough, if you can hold on to a vision and believe in it, even if you don't know fully how you're going to get there, if you can get people to what if again, you will be surrounded by people who are smarter than you about things you don't know anything about, and they will help you to get there. Like that will just happen. If you can be the one to spend your capital to hold on to an idea long enough, and you're willing to take the hits and the kicks and the punches and whatever, whatever else is going to come along with having an idea that other people can't wrap their heads around, that it's only a matter of time before other people start saying, what if she's right? What if he's right? And start filling in the blanks. And so would Rikers have been moving towards closure the way it seems to be moving now if I was still running? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. But I know one thing, what's happening now even, I don't agree with all the different aspects that are happening now, but what's happening now does not match anything I had in my mind when I said we need to close Rikers. I remember I was sitting at John Jay College surrounded by 300 of my colleagues, and it was the first time I said it out loud. I didn't tell anyone I was going to say it. I didn't prep anyone. Um, and I just said it out loud and the room, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And I remember the first experience I had with three of my reentry colleagues afterwards, pulling me aside and saying, that was a dumb move. One of them apologized to me, uh, years later, actually, I think it was, uh, Liz Gaines at Osborne. Um, and I really appreciated the fact that she sort of came around and said to me, I didn't believe it was possible in the beginning. And now I see a world where that could possibly happen. And so, you know, as you hear me talk about this, I hope you hear a bit of uh, pride in what we were able to accomplish, but also some sorrow that it's not a done deal. You know, Herb Sturz, who died a few years ago, I promised him that we'd get the job done and get to the finish line. And it really hurts my heart. I think he's the only voicemail I still have on my phone from when he was alive because he called me on my birthday when people wouldn't even call me to uh, see how my children were doing. Um, and I promised him we'd get the place closed. And so in some ways, uh, I still see myself as an advocate, an activist, and uh, Rikers in particular just holds a place for me because I feel like there's a debt to someone that I need to uh, pay off. Um, two more questions and we'll, then we'll kind of open it up to everyone. Um, I want to kind of um, go into your uh, dark night of the soul time. And I, I know that's very personal. And uh, you know, Babs Rolls, Ivy and I were, um, honored to have you um to interview you um as you were coming out of that and you were and you were prepared to tell your story and i don't expect you to go into the whole story certainly but there was a lot of learning that you went through when you had to refine yourself at a time where um a lot of people get broken a lot of people don't come back from um i know there's a lot of justice impact people and people in our support group 
who they're suffering, you know, and um, they don't really understand the kind of trauma or uh, delayed trauma response they had from things that are ha that happened in their life. And then all of a sudden, they're not in the place where they expected to be or hoped they would be, or they're estranged from families or um, a lot of things that you experienced where, um, where I know you didn't uh, necessarily know who your friends were for a little while, and then you, you had to rediscover all that. So um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about kind of what you learned in that two year period or so before you decided um, one, that you were gonna take stock of your life differently. And two, something that I learned from you that was really powerful about um, how nonprofits tend to keep people down and um, and um, people uh, don't have to be a victim to the nonprofit mentality. So there's a lot there, but um, I, know, I know you can handle it. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I don't really mean thanks for that. I don't mean it with the intonation you just heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, here's what I would say. Um, no one signs up to end up in the valley in the dark, not knowing where your friends are and just sort of feeling your way around and not knowing where your next step is going to be. But that's where I found myself. And just to concretize it, I mean, there was about six to eight months of my life where uh, clear suicidal ideation, inability to get out of bed, inability to put my feet on the floor. Um, and in some ways, the higher up you are, you know, the harder you fall, the, the more precipitous the fall is, and uh, the more difficult it is to wake up and find yourself alone when you couldn't have even imagined it just a week earlier. And for me, it was uh, particularly difficult because I spent a career, 17 years, uh, surrounded by people who articulated things that sounded sounded antithetical to the way they showed up in a moment um, uh, of condemnation and a moment of darkness. You couldn't have told me just a week earlier that people who care about justice, equity, due process, fairness, would be the first ones to sign up uh, to cancel someone and to join a mob culture. And so that was, uh, that made it even more difficult. That made it, you know, and then people say, you know, I always tell people I would have rather done a few more years in prison and gone through that moment. And people are like, wow, how can you make that comparison? And in some ways, when you go to prison, you go through it with, you know, for better or for worse, hundreds of other people. Um, and what I went through and what other people were going through at the time was extremely lonely. And there was not much to sort of compare it to and not much of a blueprint on how to navigate it. So I found myself in an extremely dark place. I did what most people do when they're in a dark place, which is actually to push away the people that love you the most because you're shameful about it. You know, you don't want them to be painted with that brush. Whatever reasons uh, you come up with, whether they're noble reasons or self-protection uh, or, or self-harm, uh, you just make it even worse. You exacerbate the situation and you alienate yourself even further. Um, and then what I started noticing in the middle of that moment, and this is for people who have maybe never done time, is I, I was reminded of what I did the last time I was in such a dark place because it started feeling eerily similar to prison, except this time the prison guards were my progressive reentry and criminal justice reform colleagues. But clearly they had sentenced me to an amount of time where I could no longer be part of society. And the same way you go to sentencing and you get sort of set back a couple of notches and we don't have any ceremony to bring people back. It felt very similar to that. So I say that because if that's the case, then I did have a roadmap on how to find my way out of it. And the first thing I realized is that you got to give yourself a corner to turn. Like if you wait for other people to give you a corner to turn, you're going to spend a lot longer in that dark place um, than you would otherwise. You have to uh, let go of toxic shame. You have to let go of the devaluing of self. You have to let go of like whatever context you had before that's leading to, uh, to you feeling as if you have less value now. And you have to just sort of recontextualize like everything that was your reality six months ago, two weeks ago, a year ago is just no longer your reality. And guess what? That's okay. I feel like I've lived my own life five or six times already. And it's exhilarating. So I think I'm going to be lo around long enough to do it five or six times again. And, and if you get to that point, 
where you can see the darkness as an opportunity. How often do you get to separate the wheat from the chaff when you think about your friends? Dark moments allow you to see who genuinely is going to show up for you. Those are the moments where you realize I have 17,000 numbers in my phone book. My phone was going so slowly the other day. I was looking through it to see where I could save memory and realize I had 17,000 contacts in my network. But when I was in my darkest place, I think eight to 10 of my colleagues were reaching out to me, asking me if I and my children were okay. Um, and I see some of those people on this call, actually. So, so what I would say to people who are like in that moment right now, is that the strength that I hope you're hearing in my voice and in my presentation and in the things I've been able to give birth to over the last five or six years, that literally comes from what I learned in the dark, not what I learned on the mountaintop, what I learned in the valley. And I know it's hard for you to understand now why you're in the valley and what that's going to lead to, but you got to have faith that there, there are things that are happening for you and with you that's building a resilience, not only to allow you to be stronger later, but here's the most important part. A big part of my nonprofit consultancy is doing crisis management. I show up in the middle of crisis like a superhero with a cape on. Why? Because I have seen the worst of it and I've made it through and I've come through with, with answers and and hope. And that's what I bring to the, most of the conversations with my client is a sense of the fact that there's hope on the other side of dark moments. And I, that's what I want to leave people with. I'm sorry if that doesn't feel tangible enough. I uh, hope it fully responds to the question because to this day, uh, about six years later, um, it is the biggest lesson I took away. We could have smaller lessons, anecdotal lessons, but that's one of the biggest things I take away. So I appreciate that question. Let's talk about nonprofits for a second. You couldn't tell me when I got out of prison years ago and I was learning from people like Eddie Ellis and Divine Pryor and other folks who sort of were in the movement, if you will, before me, even while I was in prison, that uh, having the bar of nonprofit hiring formerly incarcerated people wasn't an amazing aspiration. It felt like it. And what bothered me is that some of the jobs I had in nonprofit, I found that um, particularly progressive left colleagues who were, uh, this is not a judgment uh, statement, but coming from elite backgrounds where they were mostly disconnected from people who end up in prison, were advocating for issues that didn't seem to fully line up with what I heard from people in prison that they needed, and also weren't advocating for people the way I experienced people in prison. I always say we locked up, we lock up some of America's best and brightest. And when I was in prison, at least at the time when I was in, I think culture might've changed a little bit since then, but you don't really ask people about their criminal conviction. Like you just get to know people and you accept them for what they are. And in some ways you don't bring it up because you don't want to know. And so what does that mean? That probably means that I learned how to use computers by someone with a rape conviction. That probably means I learned how to read and write and write papers for college by someone with a murder conviction. It didn't matter. And then I ended up in the middle of this nonprofit industrial complex where I literally found myself in rooms talking to policymakers, saying things like, oh, we're talking about nonviolent first time drug offenders. Who? I didn't meet any of those people when I was locked up. That's not who I met. That's not who shaped me into the man that I became that was able to do the work. And so if for nothing else but cultural competency and courage, I thought it was really important for the nonprofit space to evolve, to include the voices and the leadership and the vision of formerly incarcerated people. My vision has evolved. <laughs> I have evolved. I've gotten older. And here's some of the lessons I've learned. One, that's a pretty low bar these days. Like, I really think it's important for people to come out of prison and decide they want to land anywhere in society that they want to land and that there's an opportunity for them to get there and that the stigma or the practical or statutory bars associated with a criminal record should not get in the way of that. And I'm trying to do that by blazing a trail right now in real estate and blazing a trail right now as a consultant. My business is doing really well. I have nine either formerly incarcerated or canceled people working for me on the consultancy side. I have 50 or so people working for me on the real estate side in various capacities. I deliberately look for people who've been involved in the criminal justice system or who otherwise have been ostracized by society uh, to join my team. Those are my people. That's where I'm always going to make my investment. But a couple of things. One, I also think that formerly incarcerated people have to be accountable for building the skills that it takes to be able to deliver. And that's a message that I think I didn't project hard enough, because what I have also found is that sometimes 
people who are closest to the pro closest to the problem are the fucking problem. And there are people who have emerged in the nonprofit space, in the reentry space, in the advocacy space um, that are problematic, that have fallen for the lights and the microphones and the funding and everything else that blinds them to the values that brought them into the space in the first place. I always ask myself, if I have to go back into prison and talk to people who I left behind about the work I'm doing today, like, would I feel proud or shameful of the decisions that I'm making? It is always important for me to be able to look those folks in the face and tell them what I'm doing with a sense of pride. And I think we've lost our way. I do think we're seeing a changing of the guards, a shifting of leadership, a second bench of leadership emerging in the space. I hope it's because we're going to continue to suggest and promote formerly incarcerated people into leadership in the nonprofit space. But I also hope that we lean into this idea that the private sector is also a vehicle for social change and that you know you you can be surrounded by people who hate capitalism but everyone doesn't have to hate capitalism all formerly incarcerated people shouldn't be put into the same bucket it's almost insulting to use the word the term formerly incarcerated people and think that you're talking about everyone with that with one full sweat with that with that term because the fact of the matter is i've met white formerly incarcerated people <laughs> formerly incarcerated people, wealthy formerly incarcerated people, religious formerly incarcerated, you name it, Republican, Democrats, independents, period. So I just would love to see the space to evolve to recognize that we are at a different point in the movement and that opportunities should be evolving the same way each of us are in the work. Uh, Glenn, that was beautiful. You actually swallowed up my last question. So... Um... I am going to turn it over to the group. Um, if you would like to ask Glenn a question or share your experience with the group, please put your name in chat and I will call on you. Please keep your questions or comments to two minutes as we have a bunch of people who'd like probably like to ask questions. Um, and uh, let's open it up. Who'd like to ask the first question? Please put your name in chat and I will call on you. Let's go with, um, let's see, one of my favorite people, Craig Stanlin. He would like to ask Greg, uh, Glenn a question. A lot of his themes were themes that you talk about all the time. Yeah, I was definitely resonating with a, a lot of what you were saying, Glenn. And it's funny, I actually wrote a piece the other day um, about adversity. And, you know, there's, there's in a sense, two gifts from um, going through adversity. One is just making it out the other side, getting out of the belly of the beast and realizing that, you know, we're OK, that we survived and remembering that nothing has happened to us that we haven't survived yet. Um, number two is, I think, probably the biggest when we realize that our journey through that adversity can be of service to someone else. That, I think, is the greatest gift of going into that dark valley and coming out the other side. And, you know, I know for me, I feel like I have an obligation to to share that um, in service of people. And it's interesting. We're kind of having this conversation now. It's actually National Suicide Awareness Month, um, which is, you know, something that really um, holds a place for me. Having said all of that, you know, you covered a little bit or you kind of did a great job on it, but I I really would love to know, was there anything in particular that you did, that you found an exercise, a tool, journaling, gratitude, anything like that, that just helped you get going? Because I think sometimes that first step is a doozy. And is there any way you could kind of identify something that allowed you to take that first step? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. A couple of things. Um, one, I remember a quick story. I remember walking around my neighborhood with my baseball cap on, trying to hide my face because I felt so shameful about uh, what I was going through. And I heard a guy come running out of the park and he said, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin. And it was at a time when I didn't want to hear from anyone, but someone calling me Mr. Martin 
uh, let me know that it was professionally focused. And he comes over to me and he says, I got to tell you something. Do you remember me? And I said, I don't I don't remember you. I'm sorry, but I know a lot of people. I apologize. He said, the day I got out of prison, I came to the Fortune Society and you were in your office with four of your staff. And I stood at your door and told you that I had just got home from prison. And you asked your entire staff to leave the office and you brought me in and you sat with me for an hour and you told me what I should be doing next as my next steps. And then his daughter came running up to him. She must have been seven years old. And he was like, I would not not be here right now in the park with my daughter if it wasn't for that conversation. And that reminded me that, yes, there are people in the world who were angry at me, who were trying to harm me, who no longer had respect for me and so on. But you got to keep in mind that that's not the entire world. Those voices are loud and scary and harmful and painful. But there are people out there that love you no matter what situation you're in. And you have to really create proximity uh, with those people. The second thing I would say is I have a balcony in my apartment. So there's one door on one side of the apartment and then there's a door on the other side. And the balcony door was scary to me because so many times I thought about jumping off that balcony. And instead I went to the other door as often as I could and I went hiking. I would just go hiking alone. I would just get out into nature and connect and realize that if you change your context for the world, I talked about this earlier, I was trying to sort of hit on it. Maybe I'll land the plane a bit better now. Like the reason things matter is because we believe they matter. The reason people matter is because we say they matter, which means that we can wake up tomorrow morning and say they no longer matter. Like the people who are harming you, they can no longer matter. And getting out into nature and shifting my context and thinking about the world differently and the way I'm situated within it allowed me to realize that I could literally let go of the people I was giving value to and move away from the harm and pain and suffering and shame associated with them and build new, healthier relationships with the people who hung out with me in the Valley. That's beautiful, Glenn. Uh, Craig, thank you for your question. Uh, Jeff, next. Thanks, Jeff. Glenn, thank you so much. Um, just a lot to grab onto. Two things. One, um, my job, my role as an executive, I describe it as being two things. It's purely crisis management. I was either bored or putting on putting on the, the underwear on top of my pants and and the cape. And like, so I totally understand from where you're coming because that was the thing that I did. The second thing I really appreciate you raising is the re the, the, the disparity between a perception and the reality of nonprofits. And I had had a uh, a lesser, but also challenging experience directly with Fortune Society, which after a few years hired me, and that was maybe you know easily post uh, post conviction. I was on probation. Um, one of the best days of my life, and once inside the way that it failed, right? The the distinction between the mission and just having run a business for 15 or 20 years myself and seeing the dysfunction, um, finding that there was a prejudice to being a white collar criminal, the idea that um, it was thought that I didn't need the job when I desperately needed the job and I needed the insurance. And just that real despite the hiring in of all the people you know, of, of the post incarcerated, the post convicted, and the commitment to doing that. Once you're in the system, once you were in there, I, I just, I was discarded at convenience, and it was startling to me. And the setback, which I hear in your story of the shame, like to be rejected from the second chance organization, compounded right, almost made worse than getting hired. And I really appreciate you validating that because that's also a hard thing when you tell that story. It tends to, I feel the shame of it falling back on me. I must have screwed up. I must have done something wrong. And so to hear your experience across the board is just really validating and helpful and I truly appreciate it. Yeah, Jeff, um, I'm sorry you had that experience. Um, and it does sound very similar to mine. Um, I'm going to talk about fortune just for one second. 
um, particularly because they're a behemoth and they've been around for a really long time. I remember the first thing I saw at the Fortune Society was a bunch of formerly incarcerated folks sitting on a stool telling their story and Fortune was charging tickets for it. And it's a play. Um, and when those young, when those people got off that stool and I grabbed them as the vice president, I pulled them aside. I said, do you want to be doing what you're doing? And they said, what do you mean? I said, you just look like you don't really want to be doing what you're doing. And it was my first introduction to that organization. And while I needed the money and I needed to be there, it's one of the shameful moments of my career that I spent so much time there. Um, I tried to move the envelope as much as I could, but if I'm being frank, like if I had to do it all over again now, I would have walked out that first day when I saw those people, what I thought was being forced uh, to be in this play where all they were doing were telling their stories and getting paid about $50 every time they did so. And what I've learned over the last few days about talking to about the Fortune Society publicly, particularly with the transition of their executive director that's been there for 34 years, I've gotten a lot of messages in my inbox from people who had very similar experiences to yours and mine, but more importantly, that all told me that they were scared to say it out loud like extremely fearful that the Fortune Society would ruin their career. And Joanne Page, who leads the Fortune Society, just three years ago picked up the phone and called one of my clients and had me lose out on a $110,000 contract. So I sort of understand where that's coming from. Luckily, I'm positioned so that that doesn't cause irreparable harm. And I've deliberately positioned myself that way because I learned a few years ago that when people want to harm you, they come after your money. For people who say they don't believe in capitalism, they definitely know how to destroy a person. They come after your ability to earn an income. Um, but at the Fortune Society, what really hurts me about it, and the reason I think I have to speak out about it and why I'm being so sharp with my message in this conversation, is that it seems like there's also a culture there that persists where people have to sign non-disclosure forms on the way out and people are threatened to keep their mouths shut. And I think $60 million a year in the names of people like the folks who are on this, uh, this call um, doesn't deserve to happen in the dark and doesn't deserve to happen in our names and doesn't deserve to cause harm to people who are similarly situated to us. Um, and so I, I think I'm going to continue to use the sharp end of the axe to speak out about my experience there. And as I said in my recording, 95% of the staff there are doing really good work and it should be uh, held up and valued. But there's definitely a challenge there with leadership and with culture. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Glenn, thank you. And I, I do have to admit that uh, family reentry in Connecticut, we uh, we did um, uh, put on uh, a, um, we did hire fortune and had the castle that that was the name of the play, and had that put on for us there and uh, we raised a lot of money and uh, I and and it pains me to hear that the people who uh, were in that play uh, were um were not adequately compensated so uh you know just a another problem of uh, um that that we need to overcome um our favorite podcaster brent cassidy you're next jeff they call that the the uh ex felon discount when you don't <laughs> get what you're supposed to be paid for so glenn i i have get, done a deep dive on you since I saw, you know, Jeff was having you on and I, I was just so inspired and impressed by what you've been able to accomplish. Um, I've been out of prison about six years and, you know, I, I, you, you were talking about six years from 20 to about when you were thinking about jumping to the unknown and you were doing pretty well, you know, you, you had gotten a job, you were around really good people, but I'm wondering what was going through your mind at that moment in time? Because, you know, we all know, I mean, most of us that are on this call, they didn't take our brains. Uh, we went through a nightmare. So, you know, we were doing really, really good. And then all of a sudden it was a nightmare that we all survived. But I'm I'm really curious because I'm, I'm so impressed about how you went through about how you did what you did, but when you did what you did, it was a big jump. There's a lot of security in getting a, a an income of one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a year, uh, being around people that you respect, and you said mm, I'm still wired different, 
I'm going to, I'm going to jump. What, what was going through your mind to do that jump? Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, a couple of things. One, you know, I, I always want to make sure people hear the most difficult parts of the story. So my first income was $16,000 a year and that's <laughs> 23 years ago, but still $16,000 a year in New York city. It was poverty 23 years ago. Um, and yes, I did get to the point where I got to 73000 at Legal Action Center and then 170000 or so at the Fortune Society. What was going through my head? Um, <laughs> you know, I left the Fortune Society with this concept paper and this vision. And um, I got to give credit to a guy named Eddie Ellis, who's no longer with us, um, who was the first person I ever heard standing in front of a mic saying, I've done time in prison and... I thought once you say I've done time in prison, you lose the mic. And to hear this guy like talk about prison and talk about what his vision for the world was, was really in inspirational to me. And I wanted to be like that. Like I wanted to emulate that. I wanted to have that level of courage. And I wanted to do something for the people I met in prison who I thought like, were it not for the zip code they were born in, the bad decision they made, the color of the skin they were born in, um, they could have been blank, you name it. And, you know, even a story I told about the person who taught me how to use computers, he was going to be in prison for the rest of his life for uh, multiple rape convictions. And yet I would not know how to use a computer today. I would not have a business today. I would not be where I am if he didn't teach me the fundamentals of how to be able to use a computer. So part of it was this urge, and no one's going to be surprised by this, to reach back and to pull other people up with me, even if it meant walking away from a very attractive salary. And not only did I walk away from it, this is the, this is the funny part I keep chuckling at. I'll let you in on the joke. Um, I took a picture of my son, Joshua. Joshua's going to be 18 in 2030. So uh, hence, hashtag half by 2030, uh, the mission statement of just leadership. The idea of cutting the prison population in half by 2030 was to save Joshua from prison. So I took a picture of Joshua in his little jammies. He had on like this little one piece and he's running around the apartment. And that's all I really had to show. And I sent that out into the world to about 10,000 emails that I had. And I said, I'm building this organization, blah, blah, blah. Feel free to click here to donate. I was hoping people donated because I needed the money. And, uh, and I got a phone call from someone named Michelle Alexander whose name probably resonates a lot more now with people. And she said, hey, Glenn, you know, I've been following your work and I saw the email you just sent out about launching an organization called Just Leadership USA. And I just want to tell you, you might think about not doing that because me and a fellow named Van Jones are launching an organization called Cut 50. And it's very similar. And I just don't want you to fail. <laughs> Talk about a moment where you're like, I, I mean, I almost went back to Joanne Page at Fortune and said, just keep. <laughs> um, but those are the moments. I always say, you know, when your knees are shaking the most is when you got to stand up and be the most powerful and the most courageous. And those are stories that a lot of people will never know. Like you get judged so much. The more you take on leadership, the more you get judged and the judgment has little to do with who you actually are. And then there are moments where you get judged, where you need to get judged and you need to hear the message. And that's equally important. To answer your question squarely before I sort of turn the mic back over, I would say that um, what was going through my mind in that moment was that there's no amount of money on earth that would make it okay to leave behind the kind of people I left in prison um, and for me to feel comfortable and okay with that. And that's always driven me. That's going to continue to drive me. Thank you, Glenn. If, if, um, and thank you, Brent, for the question. Glenn, if I'm not mistaken, Michelle wound up joining your board of directors, didn't she? Uh, she cut me a check or two. She wasn't necessarily invited to the board. You know, I didn't um, quite. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm sure I got it all wrong. Um, let's see. Jackie, you're up next. Glenn, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. I have a question, actually. I'm glad we brought up Close Rikers because, as you know, I'm like at a crossroads now. So you went from working on the state campaign to jumping into the federal space. So I came home out of the federal system working in the federal space, and I just recently started working in the state space. And I feel like I'm not being taken seriously because I'm in a totally I, I I was at this thing Saturday night 
where it was mostly state. And I think I was the only federal person. And I don't feel like I'm getting taken seriously because I'm going into a state space. How did you maneuver the two different spaces? Yeah, thanks for that. You just opened yourself up to like coaching in front of like 30 people. So buckle up. Um, you know, when I'm not being effective, uh, I go into leadership mode and start asking other people why I'm not being effective. What is it about me that makes it so that you're not taking me seriously? What would you like to see from me differently to give more consideration to what it is that I'm bringing to the table? I find that leaders don't spend enough time soliciting feedback as a way to grow their leadership. And so I start out with just taking responsibility for the way I'm showing up or not showing up. So if you really want to know why people are receiving you the way they are, ask them. That's number one. Second thing I would say is stop making this divide between federal and, and, and city or state or local or regional because it's all about people. It's all about people and power. And if you understand how to challenge power, like, believe it or not, it's very similar no matter where you go. Like, who's in power? What motivates them? Who can you get to? What can you get to? How do you shift the power? How do you move it towards the masses? Like, you can organize money or you can organize people or you can organize both. Make your decision. But it doesn't change whether it's federal, state, or local. You might need more resources to do it on a national level. But as long as you have human beings in, involved and as long as you can use your emotional intelligence to ask yourself who and what is motivating them and then to just keep going down a layer, a layer, a layer until you get the person, uh, in my case, it was the mayor of the city of New York, motivated enough to do what you want them to do, um, that's applicable across the board. And so... Start out asking people, what can you do differently to show up differently? And second of all, uh, be careful not to set up a paradigm in your head that doesn't match the reality. Thank you. I will say the only thing that did come out of my mouth when I was, I cited you. Lynn was there. I sat there and I just said, I'm going to cite perfectly a friend Glenn Martin's quote because there was so many people in the audience that misquoted you. And then I felt like I had nothing else to say because it was all state. So I love that. And it never occurred to me to just ask people. Yeah. Thanks for citing me. That cuts both <laughs> ways. Fuck with that. <laughs> Thanks, thank Jackie and Glenn. Um, um, I'm, I'm going on record right now that um, I want one of your um, your coffee mugs and I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so, um, up next is uh, Elizabeth. Hi, Glenn. I'm Elizabeth Kelly, and I found everything you had to say so compelling. But in particular, what really leapt out at me was your discussion of the nonprofit industrial complex. I'd never heard that phrase before. And the discussions about services for first time nonviolent offenders. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I specialize in representing people with disabilities. And the bulk of my clients are charged with sexually oriented offenses. And because of it, they are categorically excluded from so many different programs, whether it's diversionary programs or special programs in the facilities or as, as you know, the collateral consequences for that population of conviction is, is almost paralyzing. So I appreciate your bringing that up. And I really hope that in the future, people who are involved in this space will have the courage and the vision to, if you will, not cherry pick and to tackle the really, really difficult offenses, which are sometimes violent um, and sometimes repetitive. Yeah, you know, the way you know you're getting old is that you have a story for everything. I have a story for this. Uh, when I launched Just Leadership USA and I launched the first cohort and we were all in this beautiful space at Columbia Law School together, the first thing I was teaching people was how to get up in front of a room and spend three minutes telling your story powerfully as a way to influence policymakers to do something different. And a guy got up in front of the room, one out of 36, he was about the eighth person in, and about two minutes into his presentation, he said, and I raped my daughter. And the room got silent. 
and the room was filled with other formerly incarcerated people. And we had to take a break. And during the break, people were bothered by it. They had opinions about it. One person even said, I don't think I can be here with him in the program. And it was a moment for me to make a decision as someone who was building this multi-million dollar organization from scratch, left an amazing job to do it. And I decided in that moment that if I removed him from the space, that I was no different than the people I was suggesting were problematic in terms of their opinions about punishment and crime and proportionality and parsimony and social justice and so on. And I kept him in the program and one person left because he said he, he didn't want to be in the same program with him. And by two days later, they were calling this, pro this person, let's say his name is Mike, they were calling him Brother Mike. And I knew I made the right decision in that moment because the people who stayed got to know him as a human being and shifted the way they thought about him. And he became part of the cohort, part of the organization, part of the experience, and most importantly, friends to those people who were in the cohort. I say, I say that to say this. Something I've learned from someone who's actually on this call, I see Cheryl Roberts. Your camera's not on, but I see Cheryl. Cheryl does work around people with serious uh, mental sure. illness. I know Cheryl, yes. Uh, and so what I learned from Cheryl years after the closed Rikers campaign was that I thought we were in the deep end of the pool by saying we should shut down Rikers. Rikers was all, never about shutting a facility. Like, yes, it's a, it's, an, it's, it's a terrible facility that needs to be shuttered. But it was about changing the mindset about what we can actually accomplish in this country around criminal justice reform. It was always the sort of beacon of hope for what could happen all around the country. And we thought we were in the deep end of the pool by pushing for Rikers to close. But Cheryl taught me that there was a deeper end of the pool. People at Rikers with serious mental illness, like if we would have gone for that population first instead of the young people, we probably would have gotten Rikers closed a lot sooner. And so to relate that, the analog back to what you're saying is, I think it's important for people to start out in the deep end of the pool, because if you get that right, everything else becomes low hanging fruit in a way you couldn't have imagined when you get when you got started. So I appreciate you the work as you're doing and I appreciate the question. And that's what uh, you made me think about my experience with the work closing Rikers and how we could have been in a deeper end of the pool. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great question. Uh, General, you're up. Oh, how you doing there? <laughs> You know, you know, I can call you brother because uh, you mean that much to me, man. But uh, I heard you saying earlier about uh, you went to these people and asked them uh, what wasn't making you an effective leader. What did you find that they told you? Oh, man, <laughs> I don't have to ask if I'm effective for them to continue these days. Um, people let me know uh, how they feel about my leadership all the time, which I'm good with, actually. I, I sort of love the way I show up as a leader these days. It's like as authentic as I can be, and it comes with a lot of love and a lot of vitriol, and I'm able to sort of digest all of that and keep it in perspective. Um, when I've asked people in the past like what they'd like to see more out of my leadership, it's something that I couldn't bring to the table years ago, and I could bring it to the table now. Everything you learn in prison that allows you to survive are the very things that will allow you to fail in society. The things you need to survive in prison will set you up for failure in society. And one of them is the lack of emotions. The, the idea that if you're overly emotional in prison, that exposes you to potential harm and danger. And so therefore you learn how to move through the system suppressing your emotions. So guess what? I moved into the nonprofit space the same way. Like I was hiding things about my family, things about my vulnerabilities, things of it, everything I could hide, I would hide. And I just wanted to show up as this buttoned up, formerly incarcerated man of color that could get the job done. I remember leaving the Legal Action Center and it was a dinner for my sort of going away and leaving to go to Fortune Society. And um, I said to someone, oh yeah, I got two weeks off in between. I'm gonna go see my brother. And someone was like, you have a brother? I had worked there for six and a half years. They had no clue if I had a brother, a child, an uncle, an aunt, a mom, nothing, because that's the way I structured my life in the nonprofit space. So what I often heard from people, I'd say for about 13 years, maybe more, maybe more, if I'm being really honest, I think I've broken out of that now, is um, that they just wanted to see more of me as a human being. Like, who are you underneath all of that polish? And in some ways, that's something I take responsibility for is like, the way philanthropy is structured, you have to show up as the superhero to get funded, right? Either you're the loudest and the most obnoxious and they're scared of you, so they write you a check, 
or you're the most polished and you make them feel good about themselves. So they write you a check. And I chose the latter and it worked very well up to a certain point, but it wasn't real. It wasn't genuine. It wasn't human. It wasn't vulnerable. And in some ways it reinforced the system that you say we're trying to dismantle where you either have good people or you have bad people, which we all know is bullshit. And uh, I prefer to be the kind of authentic leader I am now, but that's the message I heard over and over General Parker. And I appreciate the way you opened up with those kind words about me. I feel the same about you. It's good to see you on this call. So Glenn, um, as you're setting off on your um, real estate uh, life, um, this, ne this latest iteration of your life, uh, which is probably bigger and more lucrative and more fulfilling in a lot of ways than anything you've ever done. Um, and I know that because you and I were sitting in a restaurant on Lenox Avenue and you were talking to me about this crazy idea. Um, I think you had just kind of started at that point. And I was questioning whether or not as a black man going into um, banks and city halls and other people you need to speak to in areas like Montgomery and Savannah and things like that. Um, what did you anticipate the obstacles were going to be? Um, how were you going to present yourself in a way where you were uh, a viable credit entity, where uh, you had a limited track record, but you knew how to pitch and now you're at almost a hundred properties. And so take us from like that moment where we were sitting there together and now where you've kind of exploded and what mistakes did you make? What worked, what didn't work? And specifically so that people can have some degree of confidence that it's okay to wander into spaces where you wanna be, but you may not know quite how to get there. Yeah, thanks for that. So my life has always been practice to theory. Like I am just a jump in, trust my gut, figure out how to do it. And then later on, someone will tell me what I was actually doing. So that's sort of how I got into real estate. That's how I got into consultancy. Um, so the real estate stuff is interesting because I'm actually selling a package of real estate right now under duress and about to lose a million dollars, like literally lose a million dollars, gone, boom, gone. Equity, rehab, gone. I couldn't even imagine saying what I just said out loud just a few years ago. Um, what I did was I... I had a partner once, I had a girlfriend once years ago, and she was a ballerina, and then she was a lawyer, and she spoke five languages. She was really amazing. And one day we, we were going out, and she grabbed coffee from someplace, and we walked about three blocks, and she said, oh, I don't have sugar or cream. And this is a woman of color, and she walked into this other coffee shop, and she asked them for sugar and cream and everything, and then she mixed up her coffee and everything. And I said, you just went in there and asked for that stuff. You didn't even buy coffee from there. She was like, yeah, I know. I was like, that didn't make you feel strange. She said, no. I said, why not? She said, because I grew up around a lot of really privileged people who just showed up in the world the way they wanted to show up. And the world matched that energy for them. And I want that for myself. And even if I don't have that privilege, I'm going to show up as if I have that privilege and try to get the world to come a bit closer to me. I never forgot that lesson. I never forgot that day we were in the city and that happened. And so when I went into real estate, I walk into every room as if I own the room. And I find that people match that energy and bring to me the things I need to move things forward. It doesn't happen every single time. It happens a lot more often than if you walk into a room with your head down, assuming you don't belong there. And so that's a big part of what's worked for me. Um, the other thing is when I don't know about something and I'm trying to learn I find three people who are smarter than me about it and ask them to have coffee. And then the answer is usually somewhere between um, those three conversations. And that's worked for me for a really long time. It also helps me to check my gut every once in a while. Um, but then that's the last thing I would say here, which is I have come to realize that your gut instinct is millions of years worth of evolution and your brain sometimes gets in the way of that. So I spend a lot of time trusting my gut when I need to make decisions. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, you know, par powerful stuff. Um, does anybody, oh, Brent has one more question. 
I do have one more question, Jeff. Um, Glenn, I, you know, I, I have had the privilege of, of talking to people doing what I do now. And, you know, there's, you know, 25 million plus of us ex-felons out there. And, you know, it's all about breaking the narrative of not everybody goes back to prison. There are people who make their second chances work and, and those second chances are hard. And, you know, Glenn, you've made that happen. What, what I've, what I've been frustrated with because I've done, I don't know, 98 interviews with people who have, you know, lived through their worst fear and, and succeeded after they got out and survived. What I'm frustrated with is that there's a lot of good people out there that have gone through the prison experience and they're out there doing good things. Um, I'm trying to figure out how do we connect the dots to become a stronger voice so that we can do more because there's so many of us and we're all out there like, like stars, you know, in, in different galaxies that aren't connected. And I'm, I'm trying to, I, I, all, and I've talked to Jeff about this too, that there are so many good people like you, Glenn, that are doing so many good things. And I've, I've got, you know, so many other people that I've talked to that are doing so many good things. How do we connect this to become more of a power of a voice that we can create more change by connecting the dots of the people that are us? Yeah, that feels like the million dollar question. I'll take a swing at it. You should have just asked me the meaning of life, bro. Make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I would, I would say that I think we need to just start out by telling the truth that like there's millions of stars in the universe and every single one is different. Like I would love to just acknowledge that we are all the same in some ways and very different in others and that that is okay. And that we don't judge uh, 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 within the sort of group uh, in ways that people judge us. So the ability to be, I, you know, one of the hardest things about working in nonprofit was uh, people telling me who I should like and who I should hate. That just drove me crazy. Like even this group, like this white collar group, there's a lot of people out there who would say, you shouldn't like them. You shouldn't fuck with them. There's too many white people amongst them, blah, 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 blah. I have never had an appetite for that sort of stuff. And part of it is that we don't push back on it and we don't say to each other, like, hold on, hold on. Like, you know, who's gonna cast the first stone here? Uh, who doesn't live in a glass house? And how do we recognize that if there's such a large number of people who have criminal convictions, and guess what? There's going to be a tremendous amount of differences amongst us. There's going to be challenges with those differences. But if we talk about it out loud, and if we model a world that we'd like to see, then maybe we can do better. That was part of the pain for me in 2017 was, even though I was in the middle of being the one judged, I said, what an opportunity this would have been for the movement to sort of model for the rest of the world, how you handle things when things are not going well, how you show up and create opportunity for restoration, for justice, for equity, and so on. And that just totally failed from my perspective. And some people at the time were thinking, well, you don't have the right to say that. Today, I feel like I have the right to say whatever I need to say about my life. When someone's writing a book about me, I tend to grab the pen. Um, so what I would say is let's start out with honesty about our differences. Let's start out with tough conversations about our differences. Let's recognize that we are all going to probably uh, see the elephant from a very different perspective. And at the same time, as long as we're all focused on the elephant itself, if you will. Um, and I think that's that kind of uh, sort of radical truth telling and compassion for the difficult moments where our biases and uh, our prejudices get in the way of us bonding more, at least allows us to show up differently than the rest of the world and create some more meaningful opportunity um, for us to model something that feels different and hopefully has more cohesiveness because the world sends, tends to be going in the opposite direction right now. And I remember meeting a guy named Ken Melman 
uh, gay white man was the head of the Republican National Committee. I was doing some fundraising years ago. And I said to him, why would you hand me a check for $50,000 to invest in formerly incarcerated people? There's nothing about your life that suggests you have any connection to formerly incarcerated people. And he said, this world is going in the wrong direction. He said, this world is full of disruption. This world is full of pain. This world is full of suffering. I think it's going to get worse. And he said, who better to lead the world in a moment of disruption than people who've been around, been through tremendous amount of disruption and shown the resiliency to work their way through the other side. Um, thank you, Brent, for that question. Glenn, with, with, with that, I can't think of a better way to end this evening and um, a beautiful, beautiful message. And uh, Glenn, you've just been a, a joy as always and uh, just so giving and vulnerable. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being our, our guest speaker and, uh, and sharing your wisdom with us. So thank you for being here. Blessings to you, blessings to everyone. Thank you for a beautiful night and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Good night, folks.